All right. So, what we are going to do today is pretty much dive a bit deeper into the hardware implementation of the FFT code using the high level synthesis and I also want to bring out some issues that finally come out okay when you are able to synthesize hardware to implement a function that's okay that's the first step but how do you actually make use of it in the context of a larger computational system okay and with that hopefully once we have gone through this part of it hopefully it should be a lot more clear to you how you can set up the system that you want for your project in order to actually establish a final demo okay given the shortage of time i might have to actually run another uh, uh, class either uh, in uh, uh, you know uh, possibly tomorrow evening because i want to make sure that by wednesday evening we have all the parts in place that are required for you to do your project and to decide on it at least in order to make the first steps okay i will let you uh, know about that by email uh, if not a separate class and definitely we will be covering a lot more in uh, the class on Wednesday so I just want to know if uh, there's also a possibility that we can probably extend it so that until the class is completed the whatever is required for that is completed if there are any other timing constraints please let me know all right so what I'm going to do now is go back and look at the problem of the FFT which is something that you have all already addressed as part of the first and third assignment right so what we have over here is that there is a computation that's being performed it's essentially some summation that you need to perform over here right and if there are n input values those are then converted to n outputs and the values themselves are complex valued floating point numbers in general okay as part of assignment 3 we also went through the process of converting this into the ap fixed format where you essentially had to use some fixed point representation a finite number of bits with some bits reserved for the integer portion and the other bits reserved for the fractional portion okay so all of these steps are already completed now the question becomes how does that c code that you have written get converted into hardware that's the first thing that we want to understand the second is once I've converted into hardware, how do I actually use it in a computation? Okay. So one thing that we need to understand to sort of get a, the overall picture of what we are trying to do over here is the specific approach that we are following over here is that we want to implement accelerators for certain types of computations. Okay. This is not the only way in which HLS or indeed hardware synthesis is used, right? What you might do is that you actually have an arbitrary system where, for example, you have some inputs coming from an ADC going through your hardware module and going out through a digital to analog converter where this and this are what we broadly call the outside world. <coughs> right? So the ADC and DAC are essentially the interfaces to the outside world. The hardware module exactly gets the inputs that it needs per sample and then processes it in some way. The other way of doing it is you have data available in some way, either from an A2D converter or already stored somewhere on a file. This goes into some kind of a processing system right? and finally goes back to a data store. So we will call these data stores in general. It's some place where the data can be stored in some format that can be read and then written. In the simplest thing, that's just the same as an ADC. right? So over here, what we want to do is essentially take this and partition it so that some part of it becomes hardware and the rest is running in software. Okay. So a term that is that you are likely to come across in the literature relating to this is essentially something that says hardware, software co-design or another word is partitioning okay in fact what we will be looking at specifically in the context of this example is the problem of partitioning we have code that is already available in software 
we want to partition it so that some part of it runs in hardware the sort of subsequent step after this would actually be do, uh, to do a hardware software co design and what co design basically means is as you are writing the software you write it in such a way that it is able to make use of hardware facilities that are available to you and also you create hardware that makes it even easier for you to write the software in a better manner okay so it becomes an iterative process you first come up with an idea for hardware you use that in order to write the software you get ideas on where the bottlenecks are you then use that to further improve the hardware and so on okay so the overall hardware software co design problem is a very generic and very broad design problem hard to solve in the general case partitioning is a bit more specific you start out with a c code or a software code and then decide what parts of it are slow and how do you speed them up that's the approach we are going to take here okay <coughs> so since we have already gone through the process of writing code for an fft i'm going to straight away jump to the process of what does the fft code look like what happens when you run it through the high level synthesis tool and try and understand a little bit about the outputs coming out of that tool okay so here i have a piece of code which the ts would have shared with you uh, the other day or you know you would have at least seen this code hopefully it is in any case familiar to all of you in terms of how you would have written your own fft code this is the test bench very similar to the test benches that we used earlier in the automated test cases right there are two files the input and the output and what we do over there is read in all the values from the input into a array called data underscore in call this function fft which takes data underscore in and generates a data underscore out and then dump that value out whatever was created into uh, well or rather read in the value from the expected output and do a comparison to check whether the data we are calling it data underscore matlab because it was generated from matlab and is sort of a reference code it would probably be better to call it a data underscore ref as a reference uh, code if you find that for any one of the samples the difference over here exceeds some tolerance that we set we basically make result equal to 1 and return result okay like i said earlier this is a self checking test bench the input as well as the expected output are available to the test bench okay so all that it does is it runs the function fft computes data underscore out compares it against the expected output and if there is a difference it flags it okay now this part over here where we return result is actually quite interesting and useful vivado hls is able to make use of that in order to also check whether not just to tell you whether or not your test data passed or failed but it can use it one step further once you have got something that passes in c in c simulation it can use the same test bench and test the hardware that it generates as well okay and the way that it does is it it relies on this return value as long as the return value is something that will be zero when it works correctly and non zero when it fails the self checking test bench can essentially create some very log infrastructure which allows this part the fft function that you have over here which right now is just a, C, a function called in c it will convert that into something which will actually take the values in data in pump them into the hardware one cycle at a time wait until the computation has completed read the data back and put it back into the array data underscore out so that the rest of the program the test bench can continue in c okay the function itself looks like this right the important part is pretty much just these five stages right so if you think about it what is happening over here is we have a 32 point fft okay so there are 32 values out here right 0 1 2 up to 31 complex values okay and the computations that happen are essentially you know there's some kind of cross computation involving some twiddle factors right the exponent of minus j2 by k n by n what we can do is rather than worrying about all of those computations we just pretty much say look i'm just going to assume that all of these inputs are fed into one block okay 
I call this block as some core FFT0 okay with some parameters I'll call this stage 0 this will again generate another 32 outputs which I can feed into another block which would be my stage 1 right similarly stage 2 stage 3 until I get to stage 4 and I get 32 outputs over here right because I have 32 point FFT the number of stages will be log to base 2 of 32 or 5 stages <coughs> right and one more last step is required which is essentially something called the bit reversal the reason for this as you would have seen is that when the data comes out of these five stages of FFT it turns out that the order in which it comes is different from the order in which it came out this would normally rather than being 0 1 2 3 this would be the 0th value then the 16th value then it would be the 8th value etc right if you look at what is happening over there essentially what will happen is that the value 0000, 000 will come out as 000, 001 will come out as 1000 right the index locations are essentially shuffled around that's a property of this particular architecture it's not a property of the Fourier transform by itself it's happens because you are using this particular architecture to implement it now this bit reversal can be done in two ways either you do it at the end or you do it at the beginning before you feed it into the actual stages if you look at the code over here you will see that it has actually been done before feeding it into the stages that's fine right the important thing to keep in mind which in general is a good thing for all of you to keep in mind when you are writing code is basically to see that how are we structuring the code we have one function which in turn calls a bunch of other functions okay broadly you can think of it as each function becomes a module in Verilog okay so in some ways writing these functions inside functions is overhead it is actually introducing lot more modules than are required but this is the whole principle of hierarchical design understanding it and making modifications becomes easy so I would strongly recommend you write your code like this don't write huge for loops and you know code that just sort of stretches out at one shot because it becomes hard to understand it hard to debug and especially hard to modify or extend okay if you look at it this code that we have over here converting this into a 128 point or a 1024 point FFT is almost trivial right once you look carefully at this and understand what it's doing making the modifications this are to this are very simple more importantly when we do the synthesis we'll find that it's actually a very useful thing to have done anyway because it also gives us a better understanding of what's going on all right the FFT0 block itself is just a for loop that is performing those butterfly computations. Okay, Why is it written in this way? This is pretty much based on the numerical recipes in C code right? with some adaptations for what is required for getting it properly synthesizable. And this bit reversal function has been implemented in one particular way which is that what we did is we stored all the indices corresponding to the bit reverse values in an array right and what you do is you just look it up if I have i the reversed value of i is stored in the array rev underscore 32 I pre-compute that and store it somewhere in a header file okay from a hardware point of view strictly speaking this is terribly inefficient because bit reversal in hardware is an almost trivial operation it just involves wiring there is no hardware at all involved right but writing the code in C to do that is not so trivial right there is a function called reverse in the apfix library which could potentially be used over here you can experiment with that and try it out but if you don't have access to such a function if you write another function that actually if you if you try reversing bits in c you'll find that it's actually a very complicated process okay 
and if you write that code it just becomes a synthesis nightmare right totally not what you want to do at all so you use a simpler approach which is basically you pre-compute the bit reverse values and store them so now we understand what the code looks like let's see what happens when we synthesize this right so some of the things so i think the tas already went through a session where they explained the basics of how to use the vivado hls tools hopefully all of you have also played around with it there is another document from xilinx that we'll upload that should give you additional information on the kind of things that you can do but at the end of the day let me make one thing clear the only way you really can learn this is by trying it out right because a large part of what you are going to do from here onwards is involves how well you understand the tool and how to use it okay so unless you are comfortable with being able to use the tool and figure out what happens when you use different options there's really nothing theoretical that we can teach you at this point okay so anyway synthesis very straightforward i just click that button it says starting c synthesis you can see the messages scrolling over there it turns out this is very fast right okay uh, So you will notice also over here that in this header file, I have two lines over here, right? The data, the data type, I have got one type def as float, which I have commented out right now. The other type def as AP fixed is what is active. Now, while you are experimenting with the different types of code, this is probably a good way of switching between the two, right? You have one type def in one place by commenting out one line and uncommenting the other you can easily change the type def so these kind of things are nothing to do with how you write how you design hardware it's more a question of these are tricks to make your use of the tool a little bit easier in this case i'm working with the ap fixed data type okay so let's see what happened to the synthesis result let's try and understand that a little bit you can see over here that there is something called the ap underscore clock right that's mentioned over here the target frequency that we had given this was given while we created the project was 10 nanoseconds target time period was 10 nanoseconds target frequency was 100 megahertz okay now this uncertainty part of it just ignore for now this is just a sort of safety margin factor that vivado hls puts in for now we can just ignore it it doesn't really affect our results in any way the point is if your estimated value is more than 8.75 that is 10 minus 1.25 it's basically going to flag a problem saying that you might have a timing error right now why this 1.25 because we put a safety margin of 12.5 percent okay if you had put some other safety margin it would have done it correspondingly but you can just ignore the safety margin altogether and just change your target if you are really concerned about it the other thing to keep in mind Vivado HLS estimates of timing and area are usually very pessimistic. What I mean by very pessimistic is they can be up off by 20% easily, right? In some cases, I've seen up to 50% off, right? So if it tells you that the estimated period is 10.78 nanoseconds, usually after synthesis, place and route and so on, you will be able to get below 10, okay? Similarly, the utilization estimates, also the numbers that we see over here, which we'll go over a little bit more detail, are usually pessimistic. So the numbers that it reports are typically a 20% overestimate. And after synthesis, place and route and so on, you'll find that those numbers decrease significantly. But before that, let's try and understand what are the rest of the data that we have over here. One thing we can see is there is this set of values called the latency and the interval. Okay. Hopefully by now the concepts, what is latency, what is initiation interval, all of you at least have the basic idea because we have looked at a few examples as we go through. The initiation interval is how often I can feed a new FFT, a new block of 32 inputs to the FFT code. Okay. And the latency is how long does it take that first block of 32 inputs to finish computation. Okay. So, to understand this, essentially we can look at it as I have the FFT block, right? So this is, I'll call this FFT zero to indicate that it is the zeroth iteration of the block. This goes from time number zero up to time number 511. 
the next instant can start immediately after that that's what the interval being equal to 511 means right and the next block can start after that and so on okay so over here the initiation interval is equal to the latency okay so if I had a situation which looked something like this right now the latency would be this value whereas the initiation interval would be this value right so in general you can sort of clearly understand that the initiation interval will be less than or equal to the latency in general okay the other thing is a latency equal to one essentially means just compute and on the next cycle it is ready which means there are possibilities in certain situations you might see a latency of zero and latency of zero essentially means it has managed to convert your whatever code you wrote into a combinational circuit it's available in the same clock cycle that you give the inputs okay a latency of 511 right and if we expand this out we'll see that it actually gives you a bit more detailed information saying in which instance or rather what was the latency or the functionality of different instances of the overall code okay so what does this mean if you look at this instance it says there is some group fft0 which has a latency and an initiation interval of 81 clock cycles okay the way to understand that is the overall fft code takes 511 clock cycles but in that there is one group or one block of computation which is called the fft0 block which you can imagine basically corresponds to the function fft0 that we wrote which takes 81 cycles so you can imagine that what will actually be happening is there will be five such blocks right there because if you look at the code there are five fft zeros inside it right and in addition to that there is also something for the bit reversal the way that we have written the code is the bit reversal happens in front right and how long does the bit reversal take we can figure that also out it in fact it doesn't create a separate instance for that right so this is one thing which can potentially be a little confusing in how vivado hls generates hardware you will see that the fft0 block over here was made into a separate module so you can actually go inside it see what happened in the analysis of group underscore fft and so on but the bit reversal is not a separate module it essentially uses something called function inlining over here okay so what that means is even though your code that you had written has bit reverse as a separate function when the compiler looked at that function it found that the operation inside it was so trivial just one for loop that it basically just you know put that for loop into the main code okay which means when you do the synthesis it gives you a result corresponding to that it considers the bit reversal as just one loop and not a separate module i don't need to send a separate start signal wait for a done signal etc from bit reversal i'll just run it as a loop okay how does a loop run in hardware The divider assignment was basically about that it's a state machine you'll start off with an initial initialization state which basically sets up the variables go into a operation state where some counter is incrementing and checking whether it has completed the loop during that time some other computations are being performed and once all of that is done and the comparison says okay I've finished running this you know 32 times or whatever it is get out of the loop okay 
So this takes 96 cycles. So going back here, essentially what we see is that this takes 96 cycles, these take 81 each, right? So 96 plus 81 times 5 should ideally have been this 511. Obviously it's not exactly equal, right? So all that that is telling you is even though the latency of a block by itself is 81 cycles, Starting the next block, transferring the data over to it and having all of this, there are some additional overheads, one or two cycles involved in each of those cases. So adding up the individual module latencies will not give you exactly the top level latency, but it will be very close. Okay, it should be normally. Go further into this. In fact, what I can do is I can go dive deeper into the FFT module right and here i clearly see that the latency and in interval are just given as 81 so this is corresponding to one block the interesting thing is the estimated time for this block itself is that same 10.779 in other words this f50 zero is your bottleneck you probably you know knew that to start with any okay there are no instances over here why because there are no further function calls there is a i mean so the f50 zero if you look at the code essentially just corresponds to this loop okay there are no further function calls over here if there were function calls they might have shown up as sub modules or they might have got inlined but the loop is there so the fft underscore label one loop you can see that it has an iteration latency of 5 it has a trip count of 16 what does a trip count mean you can see that the code essentially says i is equal to 0 to n by 2 n is 32 okay so this for loop is going to run n by 2 times in this case 16 times that is the trip count of a loop okay the latency of one individual run through that loop is 5 clock cycles right therefore what you end up with is the trip count 16 <coughs> multiplied by the iteration latency 5 becomes the total module latency which is 80 clock cycles one additional clock cycle interval initiation interval basically to take into account the fact that there will be one state required for the initialization and signaling the done of the system okay you will notice this last column over here saying pipelined and no okay we will look into that later we will get to that later when we are talking about optimizations right now i want to focus on the process itself of synthesis okay one further thing you can do is now in the top right hand corner when you are using Vivado HLS you will see that there is this block called analysis which gives you a more interesting picture of what is going on right essentially what it's saying is I have my top level FFT module it contains the FFT zero module right but if I look at the FFT module itself this thing on the right this is sort of like a Gantt chart right this is sort of the scheduling chart that we use and in fact this is precisely how the Vivado HLS is going about doing its work but you will notice that on the top the numbers that you have are 0 1 2 3 4 you know everything seems to be finishing within 12 cycles so that's the point these are not clock cycles these are so called control steps okay the idea is that one control step could may correspond to multiple clock cycles but from the point of view of the top level scheduler right i can just group everything together into one control step right and say that okay if one control step takes 20 clock cycles that's fine i will still for the purpose of scheduling all that i care about is i give it a start signal wait 20 clock cycles wait for the done signal okay during that time i can essentially consider it as one control step where only this function is operating or i can try and put something else that runs in parallel with this function okay so effectively what we have is we can think of this as 12 control steps now why 12 control steps couldn't each of these fft zeros have been combined as one that's different so just to be very clear some of these things understanding exactly what the analysis view is telling you is not easy and I have trouble with it quite a lot of the time right broadly these are the ideas that are being used over here 
but exactly why it is giving you a specific number why so many control steps why not this other number of control steps those things change because of the way the compiler has interpreted some parts of your code so they may not be entirely consistent each time and understanding exactly what it is and translating that back into what you wrote may not always be 100% accurate so use it with a pinch of salt it is very valuable information that it's giving you in terms of what it has identified as the blocks that need to be scheduled and how they are how the dependencies between them are being handled but some of the things in terms of how which lines of code got converted into which blocks those things are essentially subject to how the compiler worked on it <coughs> right so what you can do is you can even go further inside the fft0 function you will find that there are a bunch of things that are being done over there there are a lot of variables that are just called temp temp1 temp2 temp underscore s etc it's hard to really understand what's going on over there except that to a large extent this block out here which tells you the line number and the source file fft.cpp line number 33 right so if i go back to fft.cpp and look at line number 33 it tells me that there's an if condition a comparison being done over here right so if i go back to my schedule viewer and look at that particular operation line 33 you can see that this is most likely the computation that corresponds to checking whether something is less than something else right so how do you do a comparison you basically one way of doing it is you do a minus b and check whether the result is negative right check the msb of the result so some computation and addition equivalent is being done for that this line number translation essentially tells you that that's what it corresponded to you can go inside the fft loop and this also tells you you know things like this the i it's a multiplexer there is something which is doing the exit condition a comparison to decide how many times it needs to run right but you can already see that what has happened is the number of control steps used inside the fft label one is that itself is something like six uh, five control steps right so the fft zero in other words is using five control steps when i go deeper into it at the top level it showed that it was only using less than that so any one fft module was only taking two control steps okay so the idea of a control step what is defined as a control step is specific to each function that's being synthesized what this does tell you is the bit reversal ha is happening here the interesting thing is you will notice that it seems to be happening in parallel with the fft function right the reason for that you can sort of understand a little bit later as you go into it essentially all that it's saying is as and when the bit reversal is happening the fft0 function can also start <coughs> right and it can start performing its computation the only thing is only after that fft bit reversal and fft0 both of them have completed can the second fft0 start then the third one fourth one and finally the fifth one okay so it chains them together one after the other let's go back to the synthesis perspective that's where we look at our results over here so the fft0 module we saw is taking 81 clock cycles next thing of interest is the utilization estimates and if i look at the utilization estimates it's broadly divided into four classes first is the brams how many block rams am i using how many dsp48s multiplier blocks how many flip flops and how many lookup tables okay so a lookup table can be thought of as the equivalent of a nand gate or slightly more complex version of a nand gate right so the number of lookup tables that is being used is roughly the gate count of the design right but the important thing to keep in mind is on fpgas two types of hardware that typically consume a large area in an asic design namely the memory blocks and the multipliers are available as custom hardware right as predefined blocks so they don't contribute to your gate count they don't contribute to your lut count okay so in this case what we find is there is a design that uses four dsp48 slices okay why does it use four you'll have to think a bit further about that and try and understand what exactly is going on over there right incidentally it also doesn't use any block rams at all so this particular design at least the way that i have written it doesn't require any temporary storage it is able to take the data coming in 
and rearrange it entirely using the flip flops which it will use as registers so it's not that it's not storing anything anywhere but it's able to do everything it needs just using flip flops okay and finally this is the resource usage so zero block rams four dsp 48 slices 494 flip flops 799 lookup tables like i said after synthesis and after the actual implementation the number of flip flops and lookup tables usually comes down by about 10 20 percent easily number of dsp 48 slices and the number of block rams is unlikely to come down unless there has been some massive optimization where it was able to replace a block ram using some flip flops or something of that sort which is relatively rare so usually these numbers are more consistent okay all right you can actually go a bit further into that and look at detail it will actually tell you instance by instance or here there are no sub instances of the f50 zero where is the dsp48 being used it tells you exactly where it's being used it's the expression i0 plus i1 star i2 and i0 minus i1 star i2 you know all of those computations it tells you exactly where the multiplications are being used memory blocks there aren't any but they're so you'll see that the brams are zero but there are a few flip flops that are used as memory blocks storage FIFO is something that we will be using a lot more moving forward but for now there are no FIFOs in this. Essentially remember the concept of the CAN process networks. In general if you are trying to create modules that are going to communicate with each other the best way to do it is using FIFOs. Right? So in general for more complex designs we will be having a lot of FIFOs in our design but right now this is a very trivial block without any optimizations so there are no FIFOs over there etc. So I am not going to go further into this. Let's take a step back, look at the top level synthesis results, right? So you will see that what I did was this is the top level synthesis result. And when I open the group FFT, that basically opens up the second level synthesis result, right? So it's a subset of that. So going back to the top level, the utilization estimates at the top level you will see are whatever was used inside the sub module plus something extra. So the number of flip flops used in the sub module was around 400 and something at the top level it's 850 the number of lookup tables inside the fft0 module was 799 now it's 1500 why is that because along with the fft block itself there is also some bit reversal to be done there is some other state logic just to determine when the system starts how it iterates through the states how to keep track of which stage is operational all that other stuff basically adds logic and finally ends up using up somewhere around 1500 lookup tables. The number of block rams and number of DSP slices has not changed because whatever I just mentioned the state machines and so on are just so called glue logic there is no arithmetic computation or major storage of data going on there right so they don't add to those parts at all. Now the final interesting thing is the interface okay. And this interface, if you look at it, there are a whole lot of signals out here. Let's try and understand them a little bit because that becomes important to how you are finally going to implement this in hardware, right? Broadly, look at the first six signals, okay? Let's try and understand what they are. What it's saying is any module that is getting implemented has these signals. There is a clock, which is called AP underscore clock, which is an input. There is a reset and a start. Those are also inputs. Okay. And the next one is the done, idle and ready are all outputs of this module. Of this, the AP done is basically a signal saying that, you know, I started at some point, when the computation is completed, AP done goes high. AP idle is a less useful signal. There are specific cases in which you might want to use it, but most of the time you can probably just ignore this one. And AP underscore ready, at the module level at least, 
you know the idea behind it the principle is just that once you have given the start signal it will not show ready again until it is ready to accept the new input that might happen before done right so keep that in mind the way that these signals work is i give it a start signal after some time the ready signal will again become high indicating that it is ready to accept new data but the done signal might not have gone high okay done will happen only when the actual computation is completed that is at the latency whereas ready will go high at the initiation interval okay so those are the sort of standard handshaking signals that are available pretty much for any module okay but then we see that there are a bunch of other interface signals basically for the data in and data out okay and let's take data in m real and data in m image right those are the real and imaginary parts what you will see is there is an address a chip enable and the actual data the queue data so there's a in address in chip enable and in data and in fact this is there is separate data for the real and imaginary parts right i'll look just at the real okay so the real address there are five values it's a five bit value okay why does that make sense because the input is essentially 32 different values the chip enable is just something to activate saying that okay you know read from this uh, or rather uh, let's just no notice that the chip enable is actually an the address and the chip enable are both outputs of this module okay so i need to correct that both of these are coming out why because they will get fed into the module that is actually storing data in this will be some kind of a ram okay so if i feed it this address and the chip enable it can then give me back data okay this is the interface that comes by default when you create something the good thing about it is essentially what it's telling you is as long as your data is stored in an array somewhere this module the fft0 module the fft module will take care of generating the addresses so that it reads from the correct place so even if you are not reading exactly in the correct order that is from 0 up to 31 it doesn't matter it can generate the addresses correctly right in practice we might want to switch this around and say i want a stream interface instead i don't want to be giving out addresses for each data that i'm going to read i'm going to assume that i'm going to get consecutive values of data okay that simplifies my interface a little bit because well this is basically 16 real and 16 imaginary why the streaming interface simplifies my implementation is that i don't need to decide which address to read from i just say next 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 and get the data and the understanding is that the previous module rather than being a generic ram block is just something that is a fifo basically says okay this is the next data this is the next data this is the next data right once again ties in better with the kpn model but this does not require the kpn model it basically says i can read from anywhere any way that i want okay similarly on the other side you have for the output all three address right enable chip and or all all four rather address chip enable right enable and data are outputs right so once again a 5 bit out address chip enable and right enable right maybe not strictly speaking necessary you don't need to have two such signals but this is normally done for writing anyway you have one thing to activate the memory and the other one to say i'm writing into it and finally real and imaginary 16 bits each okay this is the interface that we have come up with okay 
So if you had some mechanism by which you can actually directly store your input in a block RAM, right? And then give the appropriate start signals to this FFT module. It will take care of generating the addresses to read in the data correctly, do all the computation and generate addresses that you can then feed into an out data module. and actually store the data out there. Okay. So this could be done without having any additional support circuitry. If I just wanted to use this as a standalone module. Okay. But in practice, what I'm very likely going to be doing is my FFT is probably not something that I just want to do standalone. I actually am going to use it as part of a larger computation. Okay. Which means that what I will actually have is some kind of a large C program or C++ program and somewhere in it I will have an FFT function call then a lot more until the end. Okay, Where is this going to run? It is basically going to run on a CPU which has associated with it some memory, right? The way that a laptop or any other computer works is there is a CPU, there is memory, the program that you want to execute is stored in that memory and is fetched one instruction at a time and the data on which you want to compute is also stored in the memory and is fetched as and when the program tells you to load data from the memory, okay? What I would like to do is to expand this functionality, have the ability to have a separate piece of hardware and say, can you get data either from the memory or directly written in from the CPU, do some computation and give the results back to the CPU so that it can write it into memory or directly write it back into memory. Right? And the way that this is done in practice is that we build up a system that has all of these capabilities. And in order to take care of the talking between modules, right? I have something that we call a bus. And this bus allows me to have my accelerator module attached to it in such a way that when certain instructions are seen by the CPU, they will automatically send information to the accelerator which will perform whatever work it is supposed to do and give me back results. Okay. How do we build something of this sort? What we have seen over here is we have completed the synthesis. What we can do is there are two further steps that I am not going to go over right now in class but you know you can go through it. The first thing you would have seen of course is that the C simulation works because the test bench works. Once you have completed the C simulation you can also run a so called RTL co simulation which will allow you to run the entire hardware that was generated which supposedly takes 511 clock cycles to compute an FFT and so on and you can actually see the hardware signals corresponding to that. After all that is done you can then go through the process of exporting this RTL. Okay? Now export RTL essentially what it does is the synthesis that you ran has generated some Verilog code and it is going to export it in a manner that can then be used by some other module. In this case specifically a processor plus memory system like this. We want to be able to write it out in a way that I can actually attach it as an accelerator onto a larger <coughs> system. Okay? How do I create such an accelerator? That is done in, in the other tool, not Vivado underscore HLS, but Vivado itself, right? Which allows you to create a block diagram which involves a processor, some supporting structure such as the memory, your peripherals, 
and it automates a lot of the processes such as actually creating that bus and connecting things to it okay so we are running out of time so what i'm going to do is we will uh, you know uh, have to go through this in a little bit more detail in order to uh, uh, actually get the projects underway but i'll share the information that i have so far the uh, code that was used for this demo as well as some other supporting material and by wednesday's class we would have completed going over the process of how do i create a basic system in hardware and simulate it okay once we have that the next step of the project would be that each of you essentially in your groups within a week from there you basically have finalized on the code that you will use in order to actually demonstrate your project right so to summarize what you need is a c code that performs some significant amount of computation and you then need to be able to identify within that c code where are the bottlenecks what is it that's making it run slow once you have done that you then need to go through and say okay i will design a hardware accelerator for that either by just taking the c code that i have and running it through synthesis which will give you mediocre results and then sort of going through the process of how do i actually optimize that and come up with good a good accelerator that you know is able to do it with the minimum number of clock cycles minimum resources etc right and demonstrate that as the final thing so that's the scope of the project so to say okay all right we'll stop here for now